Power is one of the most misunderstood and therefore vilified concepts in our society, says Julie Batalana, the founder and faculty chair of the Social Innovation and Change Initiative at Harvard University. Batalana goes on to say, most people assume power is predetermined by personality or wealth, or that it is gained by strong arming others. According to Batalana, the myths associated with power stand in the way of access to it for the vast majority of people who are unaware of the structures of power. In her book, Power for All, she and fellow author Tizana Casario, a professor at the Rotman School at the University of Toronto, point out that we all actually have access to power if we just understand the dynamics of it. Batalana goes on to say, power is not a dirty concept to be vilified and it is not a zero-sum game. I invited Julie Batalana to join me for a conversation that matters about understanding power and how to develop it so that you can gain control over your life. Julie, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me today. Hey, Julie, let's start with what is a definition of power? Is it a thing? Is it something to be owned? So that, that, that's a good question. What is power? Power is the ability, it's an ability, right? It's the ability to influence other people's behavior, be it through coercion or persuasion. Now, a definition is not an explanation. So then the next question becomes, but where does this power come from? And so this is what we explain in the book and what we refer to as the fundamentals of power. Let me tell you where power comes from. It comes from control over access to valued resources. I have power over you if I control access to resources that you value. And you have power over me if you control access to resources that I value. And so to be very specific here, let's take a practical example. It could be that we work in the same organization and you control access to a budget that's absolutely critical to what I need to accomplish. If this is the case, let's be clear, you do have a fair deal of power over me, right? But it doesn't mean that I have no power over you. It could be that I also stand for some moral values that are important to you and that you want to be associated with. And if so, that also gives me some power over you. So this is why we say power is not a zero sum game. It's a question of balance and it's a question of control over access to valued resources. So if you have control over that budget though, is your power not then derived by your position or the authority that you have in that organization? And so that begs the question, is power and authority, are they synonymous? I have to, to tell you an anecdote, which is the following. Uh, every year when I join the classroom and I have the pleasure of joining my students to teach about power and influence in organizations, in society, in interpersonal relationships, one of the first questions I ask my students is the following. I say, just take a piece of paper and take some time to think about powerful people you know. And then they take a few minutes and then they write. And, and then here is what I ask. That's the following question. Who listed people who are high, really, really high in the hierarchy, like the CEOs, the prime ministers, the top executives? And invariably, 99% of my students raise their hands because when they think about power, they think about authority. And that's a big issue. That's one of the biggest misconceptions about power. People tend to equate power and authority, but they are not the same. What is authority? Authority is just the formal right to give orders and commands. Now, your authority can absolutely be a source of power in some situations. You're absolutely right. It could be that your authority gives you access to that budget and control over that budget. And if so, it gives you some power over me. Now, that being said, authority is not a guarantee of power. I can tell you of a lot of CEOs, top executives, you'd be surprised who come to people like, me, like Tiziana, my dear friend and co-author, and behind closed doors, they actually say that they feel powerless because they're not able to influence the behavior of the people in their organization in a way that they think would be the right way, right? So you can be at the top and not have as much power as, as what you would believe. And importantly, you do not need to be at the top to have power. And in fact, in the research that Tiziana and I have conducted, we've looked at change makers across different kinds of organizational contexts. And the question we asked was, 
who are the most effective change makers? And what we found is that the most effective ones are not necessarily the people at the top. The people who are the most effective change makers tend to be the people who are well connected in the organization. They are the people to whom others go for advice, the people others trust, because trust is a huge conduit of influence. So yes, your authority can be a source of power, but it will not guarantee power. And if you are not at the top, you can have more power than people at the top. Uh, as you're saying that, I, I note that in your book, you give this uh, a fabulous example of Lyndon Johnson, the former president of the United States, that in his rise up through the Senate, he understood this and remarkably well. But you also point out that the, the, the instruments and uh, dynamics of that power relationship that he developed uh, as his you know, career developed weren't necessarily uh, useful to him in the presidency, especially in international environments. So th this is, this is a, a very interesting case indeed. If you understand the fundamentals of power that I, I just told you about, which is that, again, power is about control over access to valued resources, then you get to understand that if you want to map power relationships in any kind of context, there are only two key questions that you need to be able to address. The first one is, what do people value? And the second one is who controls access to these valued resources, right? Now I've kind of, I, I hope equipped you with those infrared glasses, you can read power relationships in any kind of environment. Now what's the connection to LBJ? I'll tell you what it is. If you think about his years in the Senate, he had that very specific ability to map power relationships. What is it that he did so well? He talked to all these senators. He got to understand what it is that each one of them needed and wanted and valued. And he found ways to give them access to what they needed and wanted and valued. And that gave him a lot of power. That's how he was able to influence them. Now, when he was in the Senate, he was surrounded by people mostly like him at the time, right? White American men mostly in those years, right, in the Senate. Then he became president of the United States. And we should not oversimplify. This was an incredibly complicated political moment in the history of the United States. So I'm not going to say that I'm about to provide the explanation for everything that happened in his presidency, obviously, and, 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 I, and I'm not the, the expert. But what's interesting is that if you think about it, he had that ability to map the political landscape, but he was not able to use it as well in his presidency. And is it that he lost it or is it that now he had to deal with constituencies that were very different from him? Now, he was not only dealing with the senators, he was dealing with civil society. He was dealing with, you know, like uh, other countries and, and difficult international situations, including Vietnam, obviously. And could it be that in a number of situations, his assumption was that the people he was dealing with had the same needs and wants as he did and the same needs and wants as other people he had been able to influence in the past. You know, that, that's an interesting conversation that we could be having and should be having with historians. And a number of them have actually discussed these things. And Robert Caro has written this uh, amazing biography of LBJ that I would encourage everyone to go and read. But indeed, he had that ability. It served him well during the, 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 the first part of his political career. And then he was not able to use it as well in the second part uh, when you had to deal with these many, many different constituencies. Well, as you point out in the book, uh, the power that he had over people in the Senate was he understood what they wanted and needed, and he had access or the ability to grant that to him, to them. He, and he understood what they wanted. When it came to dealing with Vietnam, his perception about what would be of uh, uh, you know, their need was out of sync with what, the way that he believed that he had power like to control them. He said, well, we'll give you this or we'll do that. And yet that wasn't helping them to achieve their objective. And so therefore his power there was greatly diminished. And does that drive home the point that power is always uh, in a fluid state? It depends on what that balance is between what I have and can offer, what you have and I need, and that, that that is always changing. And is it important to understand that as an individual so that you can work towards balancing the power relationship? Absolutely. So power is always relational. 
it sounds very obvious when I say so, but it's a big ha for people quite often because they tend to think of it as a possession. Back to your first question, could it be that power is a possession? Could it be that some people have these magic personal characteristics that make them powerful no matter what? The answer is no, because some of those characteristics may be valued in some context, but not in others, right? So it's not as simple as some people have power, others don't. No, it's a matter of what is the relationship and what is the broader context in which this relationship is happening? Because what we value is also obviously shaped by the cultural norms. And these cultural norms change. They change over time. They change from one place to another. So you should never, never assume that because one person had power or because you have power, you will remain powerful or they will remain powerful for the rest of eternity. And, and, and LBJ is, is a great example of that. So no, power is not a possession, which is a huge misconception. And then no power is not the same as authority. But I have to tell you that people quite often come to me with these misconceptions in mind. They would come to me and say, so what are the magic traits that make people powerful? Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, there are no magic traits. You know, it's relational. And then they would say, but it has to be only for people at the top. And I explain, no, power is different from authority. But then here is what people also say. They say, well, you know, I think power is not for me because I don't have those personality traits and because I'm not at the top, but good for me because power is dirty and at least I'm not getting my hands dirty. And that's the third misconception that we, we talk about in the book, which I think is highly problematic because when people think of power as dirty, they turn their back on power and then they leave it to others to decide for them and to gain ever more power, which is when power gets to be too concentrated and which is when we citizens are in trouble because what if the people who have the power in their hands abuse that power and threaten our freedoms? That's when we really get in trouble. Well, okay, so th that is uh, moving us towards sort of a societal issue around power. Who has it, uh, the control that they have, and how do we find those checks and balances? You know, we take a look at the United States, for example, the development of the Constitution and, and the system there, which was the first in the world that said uh, there have to be checks and balances because we don't want that power to get out of hand. And yet we now look at the structures within that and they become very powerful. What is it that next generations of uh, people who want to influence social change need to understand about power so that they can have influence at their local, state, and national, and, and even international uh, levels, because there are big global issues underway right now, and people have to understand how they can create that kind of influence that can affect change. You're right to say that there are big global issues at the moment, and, and to us, Titiana, and to me, this was the probably one of the strongest motivations for writing this book. We we're facing a number of challenges from, you know, obviously the pandemic, to um, sexism and, and, and systemic racism, uh, saving the planet, this is what's at stake today, uh, reducing social and economic inequalities that have been rising, uh, and enhancing and protecting democracy. Because we've had so many recent examples of democracies being in danger and, and facing very serious threats, right? So you're right to say that we, we are facing these big challenges Many of them are global and we have to rise to the occasion. And the reason why I said that our motivation was so tightly connected to this global situation is because what is it that we have to do if we want to create a society that's going to be greener, fairer, and more democratic? Well, we have to implement changes, right? And to implement these changes, we have to understand power because we have to understand in the first place the status quo. Why is it that we have such a status quo? Why do these economic and social inequalities reproduce? And, and why are they getting ever bigger and bigger? If you want to understand that, you have to understand how power hierarchies develop in society, how they get reproduced, which is one of the issues that we tackle and explain in the book, right? And then if you want to change and go against the norms, go against the power hierarchies, you have to understand how you can build the power base to do that. And this is where, realistically, we all have to realize that there's not much we can do on our own. But when we join forces as part of collective movements, this is when we can accomplish a lot. This is what we understand if we look back in history. And this is what Titiana and I have seen through the research that we've done. But what I've learned through that research and what Titiana has learned through that research as well is that 
uh, when you want to change the status quo, it's not enough to agitate. Obviously, you need to agitate. You need the agitators who will explain to everyone why the status quo is not acceptable. But you need to move beyond that. You also need to innovate and orchestrate. So for collective change to happen, you need people, you need organizations playing all three roles, agitators, innovators, and orchestrators. And that's when you can have an impact and try and change existing systems. So that, I think, is one of the critical dimensions. Okay, within doing that, does the in do each of those individuals who want to be a part of that change, they have to understand what their own personal power is and how they bring along other people that can create a collective power. And what is it that's at the basis of that for, for especially young people as they look at the world in front of them and say, we need to change something. How do I, but how do I go about doing that? You know, I have the great privilege of working with a lot of young people at Harvard University and beyond. And I created there the Social Innovation and Change Initiative to support the, the work of those students and, and, and social innovators, social entrepreneurs, social change makers who want to be part of the change. And uh, what I've come to realize in working with a, a number of them is that far too often you talk to these young people and, and, and they have those amazing ideas and, and they have the energy and they have the enthusiasm, but they push power aside. They think of it as dirty business again, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. And so this is back to your question. Like it starts with uh, just you know the acknowledgement that power is the energy you need to harness if you want to get anything done. And yes, you can use it for good. Like let's not be naive. Once you have power, you and I and everyone and these young people, everyone is at risk of abusing it. So you better cultivate humility and empathy to make sure you're not going to cultivate it. And collectively, we should have the systems of checks and balances that you talked about because we cannot trust anyone to not abuse their power. But we all need to engage with power, understand the fundamentals of power. Because once you understand that power is about control over access to resources, then you also get to see that there's always something you can do to gain a measure of power, either by yourself or with others. But for that, you first need to understand that it's not a magic trait, that it's not the same as authority, that it's not dirty, that it is, again, about control over access to resources. So in his book, The Prince, Machiavelli basically said, you know, is it better to be loved or to be feared? And he was going with the idea it's better to be feared. But you say the exact opposite is the case. Well, you know, what, 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 what I say, so it's interesting because if you think about Machiavelli, Machiavelli wrote uh, his famous and, you know, incredibly impactful essay more than 500 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if, if you read it, some of the sections are, are still so relevant today. Uh, but let me start by saying that he wrote that essay for a prince in the 16th century. And what we decided to do is to write that book for all, including those who've been excluded for pa from power for a long time. Because that, the fact that this be, they've been excluded doesn't mean that they should remain excluded from power. And, and, and we are convinced, based on our research and teaching, that once you explain power to people, then you can help them unleash their potential and be part of the change that they, they want to be a part of. Um, now, Machiavelli was writing, you know, like in, in the 16th century. So this was a very different kind of historical period where the norms, where the laws were very, very different from what they are today. So, right, so is it better to be feared or loved? Well, you have to be careful when you ask these questions and you have to be careful if you just go back to things that were written a long time ago, because some aspect of what he's been writing, I continue to teach in, in, in the classroom, and, and some aspects are really rooted in the period of the time. Now, we are at a transition point, I think, this is kind of a fork in the road. We have choices to make ourselves. What is it that we are going to collectively value? Uh, are we going to be in a world in which it's going to be better to be feared than loved? And let's be realistic. Today, if you look at what's happening across the world, there are a number of countries where everything Machiavelli wrote, right, five, more than 500 years ago, would apply because yeah. those are dictatorships and authoritarian regimes. And we have to take that very seriously. Uh, but 
are we going to try and be part of a change where we're going to value different kind of abilities and characteristics so that the leaders who have empathy and humility and are less likely to abuse their power would be the ones we would be selecting instead of the ones that would just be projecting strength. Like it's up to us in democracies to decide. And I think this is such a critically important choice. So I think it's critically important as well because, you know, I'm, I am sort of guided in my own motivation in life by something that Aristotle had said, that it is the responsibility of each of us as, you know, fully functioning human beings to realize our potential because failure to do so is a loss to all of society. Well, if you're in a society that doesn't allow you to realize your full potential because your life is being dictated by someone else, well, then we all lose. And this is what I like about your book. You're saying this is, is the tool that helps you to, yes, have power, but it's also a path to self-actualization and, re actualization and realization. Yes, and, and I hope that that's how the book will be helpful to readers. I hope that they will read that book and then get to better understand how they can build their power. But I also hope that in reading the book, they'll come to think about how they will be using their power, for what purposes, how they will join forces with others, and that they also understand that it is completely foolish to think about your own power in interpersonal relationships, in your own career, without accounting for what's happening more broadly in society. Right? The existing power hierarchies constrain some of us, enable others, but is it fair? Like if it's not, you cannot just close your eyes. You have to take action, you have to join movements, and you have to want to be part of the change. Uh, because critically, what we have to do, you know, you were talking about the founding fathers and the, you know, like the process of democracy building in the United States. But if you think about the critical components we have to keep in mind, how do you make sure that people don't abuse power? And how do you give everyone a chance to build their own power base and be free? Well, you have to share power and hold those in power accountable. Right? And because I'm French, as I'm thinking about power sharing, I'm thinking about Montesquieu and, and what happened during the Enlightenment period and so many of the writers, you know, not only in France, but across the world who also inspired the founding fathers in the United States. But power sharing is absolutely critical. The division of power is critical. And then you need to hold those in power accountable. This is true in democracies and critically important. I think it's also true in companies and in organizations. We need to hold those in power accountable but not only for their financial performance, also for their social and environmental impacts. I completely agree. And I thank you for writing your book and taking the time to give us an insight into it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me.